right, uh, first up, Jimbo Fisher on Sirius Satellite Radio. Uh, in, in an interview said, we need revenue sharing. We need a salary cap for all schools. And the other part of this is the tampering that other schools do with players is utterly ridiculous. The big schools are going and getting players constantly from other schools, and it's being done illegally. Those guys are developing players, and then they get to go up and, and reap the rewards. Um, here's the thing about tampering. Right. <clears throat> no one can really – and this is this is the – kind of um, the rule number one about the coaching circles is you don't rat people out. Correct. And part of the reasons you do that is that job security. Well, job security, you might have to work with people, but the other thing about it. So like if I'm at A&M and I know that Oklahoma has directly tampered with a player on my roster, Mm -hmm. if I'm Mike Elko, I have to be damn sure that no one, in not only my circle of coaches, but now name, image, and likeness collectives. Correct. And all of that has done it either. And that is, that's like, it's too much to deal with. Because all it's going to take is, you know, a picture of one guy and a coach, right? Mm. So you got, you know, let's just say it's Mike Elko. Mike Elko knows that Oklahoma, you know, essentially stole a defensive tackle off his roster. Correct. And knows that it was the defensive tackles coach that recruited him when he was at another place that did it, right? Mm -hmm. So he knows that that happened. He he has direct evidence of it. Well, they could have a picture of Mike Elko shaking hands with the NIO collective guy who who paid it, you know, who stole a guy off their roster. Right. Right? You know, five years before, you know, and be like, oh, look at this. You know, this is you and this guy. You're telling me he didn't tell you that he talked to so-and-so and and, and then all of a sudden he transferred Mm -hmm. there. So, like, those things, it's very hard to police. And here's the the rub. There's a way to do all of this. It's not like this is completely new. Mm -hmm. But it's going to take the universities admitting that this is not amateur athletics anymore. They just won't do it, and I don't understand what the with the holdback is because more every day more and more evidence comes out to show that it is. It, this is a big business. This is professional. They're they're professional athletes, right? That you're yeah. dealing with now. Um, and, and then as far as like curtailing the tampering and things, I don't think you can necessarily do that um, with all the different ways that you can get in contact with people, whether it's DMs or different technologies where they your messages disappear. And I know everything's technically not gone, but in the immediate sense, it can be gone. Um, also, I think it's difficult, as um, we've seen throughout the years, especially lately, that you can't keep track of everybody on your staff. We've yeah. seen it with the Connor Stallion stuff. We've seen it with Dion and the coach going to Saudi Arabia. We've seen it in other instances. It's just there's so many moving parts. And I think the bigger the school and the more people you bring in, whether it's um, an analyst and, and that the trickle-down effect from that, I don't even think some of these head coaches know who's totally all on their uh, their staff or in their building at times. So, yeah, I think it's difficult to track that. Um, and while you want to hold people accountable, you know that even if you do that, even if it's not like a player or something, you make somebody mad, they're going to come back on you and discover something about your program or something you've done in the past and it caused more turmoil for you. So it's kind of like a, a no win situation for everybody involved until somebody finally steps up and puts some structure behind this and penalizes you for actually tampering. But I mean, it's kind of like a long fight ahead that I don't know how you're going to fix. Yeah. I, I yeah, I, I don't either. Now look, there's a way to maybe, um, so, um, you know, to maybe you can't really stop it because uh, Scott of Greywater Watch uh, makes a good point here. Like, look at the NBA. There's too many ways to communicate. Yeah, that's what I was getting there's, at. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's too, too many ways. Easy. It's too easy to do. Um, but there's like if you start treating it like free agency and other things, where you do put rules in place for it, mm-hmm. like you know, I'm not going to use I'm not going to use the term guardrails. But if you you like if you have if you have a system in place mm-hmm. that's not just chaos, then there's a way to at least slow it down. Like but, it's but not, you got to figure out how to put a system in place without getting sued now, yeah. and nobody can do yeah. that. 
Brett Bingham, Brett Bingham, I agree with Jimbo, but I do find it ironic that, that the pot is calling the kettle black. Oh, yeah, dude. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure that that is what's going on. But I hearken back to a moment and um, in the 2008 presidential, one of the debates between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. And it's one of those things where someone had an opportunity to, like, you maybe make a dent and they whiffed on it. And this is obviously Mitt Romney because he didn't win or come close. But in the debate, they were talking about outsourcing and how many manufacturing jobs had gone overseas. Mm -hmm. Well, Mitt Romney had done that. Like one of his businesses had, like he's a very wealthy man. uh, And he had sent a lot of business overseas. And he said in the debate when they asked him about it, he said, look, there's a way to fix this. But it's like he didn't want to admit that like, he knows how to fix it because he knows that's every problem exactly why it happened, right? Yeah. So what he should have done is just been like, "Look, I've outsourced. I know how it works. I see the error of my ways. I should not have done that. And here's how I will fix it. So I know that I have a plan that will completely counteract this because I participated in it. So if you admit that, like, but that's the same thing with." you know, these college leaders and not want to admit that they're pro sports. They're not saying like, oh, there's a model for this. Mm. Then look, there's a model for this all over the world. There are 15 and 16 year old kids in Europe playing basketball and soccer at the professional level and getting paid to do it. Yep. And no one's getting hurt. You know, like <laughs> it's just how it is. And, you know, I like, I would love to just kind of dare, like find the most like, crazy patriotic ones have been like, hey, Europe is kicking our butt in this. How do you feel about yeah. that, Mr. America? And then they'll be like, hell no, not in this country. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want the Frenchies to do something better than us. Like, this is what you do. So take models, adjust. Like, obviously, you know, you have to get an adapter, right? Mm-hmm. You know, what works in Europe doesn't necessarily work here, but if you get an adapter, then it'll work, right? So get adapters to that. Adapt to the realities of the situation and then move forward. Um, because I do think that while like there doesn't need to be a lot of restriction on players' earnings or caps on earnings, right. I do think that like if you admit that you are a thing, then it helps people all agree to this. And then if you want to be part of it, you have to agree to rules. you know. Right. And, and it's out of whack, and it's always been out of whack. And if we can even get it close to balancing, it's going to start with everybody admitting what this is. Mm-hmm. And that's the problem. You have to admit what it is. And, like, I, I don't think a salary cap for schools is ever going to happen in a million years. It, you know, like, there's just not. No, they can't agree on anything right now. There's no way you're going to agree okay, on what the salary the, cap would be. Is the SEC going to agree no, on the salary cap no, so that the no. Big 12 can compete with them? No. No. I mean, that that's just it. So, um, yeah, absolutely. All right, next up. Uh, to that end, we have several midseason uh, transfer announcements. Right now, two of them are from UCF. Um, UCF wide receiver Xavier Townsend, who had four receptions and a touchdown versus Colorado last week, got a red shirt and entered the portal. Also, UCF de- defensive back Byron Threats, or is it Threats, has informed the UCF coaches that he plans to red shirt and transfer He's got a year left, played his first three years at Cincinnati and was part of the 21 CFP team, has 19 starts Mm -hmm. under his belt in college. And then another one, NC State defensive end Red Hibbler plans to enter the NCAA transfer portal. Uh, His agents uh, of Young Money APAA uh, say he led NC State in stacks last season with 6.5. He'll have one year of eligibility remaining Um, he had six tackles this year, a Juco transfer, seven tackles for loss in 2023, uh, his first season at NC state and six and a half of those were sacks. Now he like, that sounds like a a good ish player, but like, who are you kidding, buddy? Yeah. Like some of that, like sometimes you're like, okay, he had seven tackles for loss. Okay. That's good. That's great. I'm sure they appreciate every single one of them, but I mean, when I hear about a guy like wanting a better opportunity, I'm, I'm thinking of a guy who's like got 19 sacks, you know, like yeah. has, is in the backfield a bunch. So uh, I'm not saying those guys are being tampered with. <laughs> I mean, I don't know that, but those are the kind of things you, you see and go, 
okay, well, somebody's said something to them. Like, going back to Matthew Sluka. Yeah. Some kind of bad information got in Matthew Sluka's ears and his family's ears, and that started all this. When that happened, we will probably never know. No. Did that happen on his recruiting visit? That it happened sometime in the middle? What was the thing? Because the collective says, like, nobody ever said $100,000. No. The coach, I think the coach in question is like, I, I don't know if I ever said $100,000. Well, there's a major difference between yeah. the 100000 and the 3000 he was getting. So, like, yeah. so there's a major disconnect somewhere. Well, also, like, $100,000 to get a, a guy who's at Holy Cross? Yeah, no. Like, no, the market. No, the market for sure. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. So it, it's kind of kind of ridiculous. From our friend Dave Bartu. Is this where we are? Am I on yep. the right spot? Yep. Okay. From Dave Bartu, uh, who is College Football Matrix. Um, SEC Mike on his show today, Michael Braddon, um, mentioned that he didn't think that AM had a top five home field advantage in the SEC. That's now a look, stupid comment, first off. Yeah. <laughs> first off. Yeah. I mean, not really, because he's gonna he's gonna get hate watches from College Station all over the place. But um I mean it's not like it's every it's in the eye of the beholder. But Dave Bartu, home field advantage is largely a myth cooked by fans that believe they have a strong impact on game outcomes. And ironically, the SEC has the lowest home field advantage in college football with over 74% of all games the last decade won by the better recruiter regardless of the field. So Especially when it comes to this mm -hmm. kind of a thing. I mean, what college football major, what Dave does, is he finds who the best recruiters are, who the plus recruiter, like who are that, and then he ranks them. Right. <clears throat> um, he then sells that information to schools and conferences. So it's not, um, it's not like public because it's privileged information. Right. But... He will, like, he's come on our show a bunch of times, and he'll tell you who who overall rated are the best stats, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and those things. So, Bartu is just saying here, like, look, home field advantage doesn't matter 74% of the time when the better recruiters on the sideline. The two best recruiters in the SEC were Kirby Smart, Smart and, and Nick, Nick Saban, Saban, right? So, there you go. And then the other, okay, and I'll even go back another few years. If you go into the last decade, who was the who was the best, like, I would say the best, like, pound-for-pound pound recruiter. Now, he wasn't the best pound-for-pound pound coach, was Ed Orgeron. Ed Orgeron. He could recruit. He Yes. I mean, he he helped build 05. Like, he built Miami teams. Mm -hmm. He built USC teams. He, could he built LSU teams. Now, when it came down to X and O coaching, ah, not really his. Miss. Not really his total bag. You no. know, like, he's, he's. He works like he's kind of stuck in the middle of, I think his style of building a team works well in the modern era, but he's just not new enough, no. right? He's just not new enough. Plus, I do think he really enjoyed like the post-2019 That thing. got a little to his head. And, I, uh, I think he took off the rails. too much of a victory lap on too it. Too much, yeah. But now, I mean, he's very clearly, if you listen to him talk, loves being a retired football coach. I don't blame him. No, I got mean, a hell of a spot in Miami too. Yeah, this condo's he, sweet. Yeah, what do you what do you say? Like, oh, they paid me nineteen million to leave. I was like, I'll get the hell out right now. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh boy. No, I, I think this I'm gonna is go back to my take. condo in Miami. <laughs> no, go I, think, <laughs> I think it's an interesting take. I mean, we, we see some places where home field advantages do work, um, but I think like for instance, like here in Waco, we've seen it where Baylor has no home field advantage, and they've had no. Um, recruiting success against other programs. So it kind of goes hand in hand. But you also have the weird scenarios where, like, BYU technically isn't ever going to out-recruit somebody, but they have the perfect situation where if it's a night game and the environment's right, I think it's kind of in between that. Uh -huh. um, now, when you get into the SEC, I think there's just so much parity there and there's so much depth that if you have, like, a wrong injury or somebody, it could be your night. Um, and I think – but if you kind of look at last year, LSU lost to Ole Miss – 
I think if you look, uh, Lane Kiffin awfully, obviously was the better recruiter in that. Yeah. Lane Kiffin is an elite recruiter. So I think there's some validity to it, but I think it's more so somewhere in the middle on where the truth uh, actually lies in the statement. We're going to talk about it with Evan Abrams a little bit later yeah. in the show when it comes to gambling, but he, he has, uh, he has some, he has some hard numbers on it too. Yeah. Uh, he has some hard numbers on it. So that's at five o'clock ish, uh, today on the show. Just real quick, a couple things, Trey Harris, Ole Miss. Uh, he has been downgraded from probable to questionable for this week's game for the Rebs, uh, which is not great news for them because he's one of the best players on their team. He's fantastic. Like, people aren't talking about Trey Harris because there's, like, a couple other guys, like, yeah. putting up, um, like, kind of ridiculous things. But people need to start talking about him. He's a Belindikoff candidate for sure uh, this year. Also, uh, here's a couple of fun ones. UNLV is having a donut eating contest uh, to kick off Breast Cancer Awareness Month will it be uh, eating pink uh, frosted donuts the fastest. Ten minutes during the game tonight with Syracuse. Um, hot dog eating champion and UNLV alum Miki Sudo, former UNLV offensive lineman Dr. Tony Terrell, and UNLV ho- hoops coach uh, Kevin Kruger are among the participants. They will see who can eat two dozen pink frosted donuts the fastest in honor of that uh, my money's on Miki Sudo. Oh yeah, as a competitive eater, but a really fun thing. Um, I hope I'm I'm locked in, and I can see that. I can't wait for them to share it to social media because I will. We'll we'll certainly clip it and show part of it. I yes. I think that. All right, one more thing. We're gonna save the H Town Blue video okay. for the four o'clock after the Clinton Portis Woo. most Miami story <laughs> of all time. Uh, this was asked about in the chat room. Yes, FIU. Miami Vice uniforms, these are chef's kiss. I love them. So great. FIU, same deal. Same deal we made Western Kentucky. Emory, you know what to do. Same deal. What, at, like, I'll do something silly within reason. Like, I was, I think I'll, I'm going to paint myself like the Hilltopper. I don't know. Whatever I have to oh, do. Oh, Halloween, to, man. Hilltopper. Yeah. Whatever I have to do to do this, I'll dress up like Don Johnson <laughs> on the show. I'll do that. I hate Halloween. I hate it. I'll but I will it. do it to get one of these helmets sitting back here. I will absolutely do it. And, uh, and Green Grin Iron, our sponsor who does a lot of this stuff, they don't have them yet, but I will. I will send get a them couple, in stock. I'll, green, come, green I'll send a couple emails. <laughs> and if that doesn't happen, then we'll get them from Green Green Iron. But it, it, Western Kentucky, Florida International, FIU, FIU. Look at me. Look at me in my eyes right now. I want one. I want it. I, it's awesome. Awesome. I love these. I think this is the most Miami thing ever. I kind of wish they would make these their full time uniforms and just fully dive in and embrace it yeah um yeah like this is pit, magnificent like, dude. they're pit bull they're miami vice like you're there embracing they all know. parts of it they know give me a jimmy buffett uniform in there oh <laughs> that one that one i'll just buy i'll just do it as a parrot head